Welcome to St. Andrew United Church of Christ, where our mission is to love, serve, and pray. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. And we invite you, if you're new to St. Andrew, to please let us know if you would like to be added to our weekly e-blast list or the weekly calling post where you receive a message through the phone. Information to contact us is at the end of this video, and so is the monthly benevolence video that tells about our commitment this month to the Neighbors in Need offering. Today's worship takes us into a closer look at one of the lines in the Lord's Prayer, so that perhaps we might go deeper in our faith and in our understanding and in our questioning and in our wondering and in our praying. Let us worship together. And let us remember that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here and wherever we might meet you. Listen now to the call to worship. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our lives. We need not look up to find God, we need only to look around within ourselves, beyond ourselves, into the eyes of another. We need not listen for distant thunder to find God. We need only to listen to the music of life, the words of children, the questions of the curious, the rhythm of a heartbeat. We worship the God who inhabits our world and who indwells our lives. Let us pray. Creator of beauty, designer of life, we pray that we might seek your intention for us to see the beauty in the world you have created, to love our neighbor as ourselves and to seek you as our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Guide us in ways that help us fulfill your intention for us to have life and have it abundantly, to share in your love, to care for your creation, to serve you. May we find your intention in the world around us in our hearts and live out your intention in the ways we care for and serve others. In the name of Christ, who fully lives out God's intention for us. To love one another, we pray. Amen.
The Gospel lesson today, according to St. Matthew, from the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May we hear the still speaking God in these words. God is still speaking. There are some stories about my children that of course forever stand out in my mind. This is one of them. When my son Josh was in first grade, he came home from school one day and he said, Mommy, Jimmy used the F word today in school. I thought to myself, oh no. Okay, honest, true confession here, I thought a lot more than oh no. I actually thought to myself, probably a bunch of the curse words that I was hoping Josh wasn't learning. Anyway, I tried to keep a cool composure, and so I said to Josh, Joshua, how did you learn about the F word? Joshua said, I heard my friends talking about it, and I know that it's mean to say that word to someone. Yes, it is, I said. And then I said, do you know what the F word is? Joshua said, yes, mommy, and that's why I know that it's mean, because the F word is fat. And it's very mean to call anyone fat. It hurts their feelings, and that's what I told Jimmy. Mommy just smiled. I want to talk to you about another F word today. Don't worry. I have not dropped an F-bomb in a sermon in 29 years of ministry. And I'm not going to start now, especially when I'm on YouTube. And who knows who all is listening. The F word that I want to talk about is a really good word. But it doesn't always feel that way because it's a really, really hard word to deal with. And I think if we're honest, it's a word that has become an F word in that we cringe at hearing it when we're honest, and we don't really want people to talk about it. The word is forgiveness. Forgiveness. We say that it's important, but I think it's one of the least respected and least revered concept of our faith. We talk about it rather flippantly as if it's fairly common practice in our lives to forgive people, but it's actually a really hard word and concept to deal with when we're honest 
Am I right? Forgiveness from others is hard because asking for forgiveness means that we have to acknowledge that we've made a mistake, maybe a little mistake, those are sometimes easier, but maybe it's a huge mistake that makes us look incompetent. Asking forgiveness might mean that we've hurt someone, maybe hurt their feelings a little bit, or maybe hurt them a lot. Asking forgiveness might mean that we embarrassed someone or that we judged someone and made a conclusion before we had all the information. That's hard to admit. It might mean that we betrayed someone or deceived someone or lied or cheated. The list goes on. The point being that if we are asking for forgiveness, it's likely going to be really hard to do because we don't like admitting that we were wrong, even though it can feel so redeeming to do so. It really can. I think that all too often, rather than admit we were in the wrong and that we need forgiveness, we instead turn the situation around and choose to focus on something that the other person did or just blow off the person that we wronged instead of dealing with it. It's hard to ask for forgiveness. And offering forgiveness to someone else is also really hard to do. Many of us would say that there are some things that are unforgivable, and yet, what are we using to determine what's forgivable and what's not? Perhaps the real reason that forgiveness is so uncomfortable for us is because most of us know that we aren't really listening to what Jesus had to say about it. Not really. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, and he gave them the words that have become the Lord's Prayer, words that we pray together often, words that include, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or sins, or trespasses. I wonder how often those words actually soak into us when we're praying them. Perhaps this passage and parable in Matthew's Gospel today will help us. In Matthew's 18th chapter, Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness, and he thinks he's being pretty generous when he suggests that he could probably forgive people seven times, and that certainly was a large number. Wasn't that enough, Jesus? And Jesus responds to him by saying, um, no, how about 70 times seven? And Jesus is no doubt echoing the petition in the Lord's Prayer that we should forgive others as we have been forgiven. And it'll become clear that it's not about numbers. I think it's helpful to go a little deeper into the parable that Jesus tells. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And one owed him 10,000 talents and could not pay. The servant begged for mercy just to get an extension. He wasn't asking to be relieved of the debt, but the king having mercy on him not only relieves the debt, but he forgives the entire debt. Now to get an idea of what that debt was and to see the extremes in which Jesus was talking and making this point, because Jesus often used exaggeration and hyperbole to really drive the point home in his parables. So it's equivalent to about 15 years of a laborer's wages. One talent is equal to 15 years. And so he owes him 10 talents. So he owes him 150,000 years wages. So think to yourself a minute, your household yearly income, I don't care if you use the net or the gross, multiply it by 150,000. And that's the amount that the king forgave. So you get the exaggeration that Jesus was using to make a point. Forgiveness has no limits. And then to make us even more uncomfortable with forgiveness, the parable continues like this. That same servant, the one that was just forgiven all that debt, he comes upon one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And he seizes him by the throat and says, pay me what you owe. And when he couldn't, he throws him into prison. 
the king heard about it and was furious, and rightly so. The one who was forgiven the 150,000 times your annual income has come across someone who owes him just 100 denarii. Now, a denarii is one day's wage. So 100 of them is about a little over three months. So take your income monthly, multiply it by three, and you get an idea of the much smaller amount that this person owed. Still not a small debt, but everyone who hears the parable can get it. How could he possibly not forgive that relatively minor debt when he had just been forgiven this huge, unimaginable debt? When we hear this parable, it's pretty easy to see how ungrateful the servant was to the king. He couldn't even forgive a little debt. And so what are we to make of a God who forgives us extravagantly, forgiving us over and over and then watching us in turn refuse forgiveness to so many people in our lives? Biblical scholar Caroline Lewis says that the point of the parable and the numbers that Jesus offers is that the act of forgiveness is already a limitless, measureless act. It's not about numbers. Forgiveness is never not present in our lives and in our relationship. She says, that's the issue. Forgiveness is part and parcel of the kingdom of God. It's a constant. It's not optional. End quote. And yet, it's also not as simple as just telling each other, okay, I forgive you, or just forgive him, just forgive her. That's cheap forgiveness, and that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about imagining the king hearing that the servant wouldn't forgive the smaller debt after he was forgiven so much. Can you imagine God's pain in seeing how we humans treat one another after God has loved us and forgiven us so much? So what would it mean, though, if we lived lives of forgiveness, with forgiveness as a part of who we are? I certainly do not have this all figured out, and I hope you don't think you do either, because it's not easy at all. Forgiveness is really, really hard, and I think we need to let it be hard. We need to stop looking for easy answers to so many things in our faith, and this is one of them. This sermon is not going to tie up all the questions that you ever had about forgiveness. We are meant to struggle with issues of faith. And forgiveness is one of the issues that we really need to struggle with if we're going to grow. We need to be do, willing to do the hard work that Jesus calls us to. We need to think about what does forgiveness mean? What does it look like? There are a couple things that are absolutely crucial to hear in this discussion, and they're crucial for me as I'm preaching about this because there are two things that I really worry my listeners will not hear me saying. First, it is crucial to assume that you and I do not have the forgiveness thing all figured out. And that we never will, but that we need to do better. And that it will be a lifelong journey in our faith to understand forgiveness on a deeper level and to practice forgiveness in a deeper, more faithful way. Just like it's not about finding the right number of times to forgive, it's also not about finding the right formula for what is forgivable and what isn't or, or how long it takes to forgive. Forgiveness is just not that simple. I don't know how we can be faithful followers of Jesus if we're not willing to make forgiveness a lifelong process in our spiritual growth and life of faith. If you find yourself quickly saying that you'll never forgive so-and-so, or if you find yourself thinking about or talking about a grudge that you've carried for years, that's a good clue that you're probably not struggling with it enough. And you've got more work to do, and it's hard work. It might even make you want to curse sometimes when you realize how hard it is. And while sometimes we can't forgive someone, we 
can't find it within ourselves to do it. God can. And God can help us grow in our ability to love and forgive. So our struggling absolutely needs to include a deeper prayer life. The other crucial thing for you to hear from me is that forgiveness does not mean allowing people to abuse you or disrespect you. It does not mean allowing yourself to be used as a doormat and just putting up with whatever someone else chooses to do. Never. Whenever I talk about forgiveness, I seriously have a fear that someone listening will think that I am telling them to forgive the abusive person that they're living with and to keep putting up with the abuse. I am not. Forgiveness does not mean giving free reign to anyone who would do us harm. That is not forgiveness and that is not love. And everyone deserves better. God's hope for us is to live our most authentic lives, to love and be loved, and that cannot happen when we're being abused. Forgiveness is a way of loving self and others. It's a way to see ourselves and others as children of God who are worthy of love. It's wanting the best for the other person, even when that person hasn't wanted the best for us. Too often we think we can't give something to someone unless they return it. That's why forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is wanting the best for the other person, even when they do not want the best for us. Forgiveness might mean staying in a relationship with someone, and it might mean realizing that we cannot. We can forgive someone and never spend time with them again. I can see someone as a child of God. I can want the best for them in life. I can have honest conversation with them, peaceful confrontation, and still choose to not be in relationship with them. Because forgiveness is ultimately a decision. The decision to accept both that you cannot change the past and also that the past does not have to, have to hold you captive. Forgiveness helps us move on from past hurts and angers. When you cannot forgive, you remain captive to the past. And so forgiveness in this sense, it's freedom. Freedom from the past, freedom for the future. The kind of freedom that God wants for each of us. One of the best definitions that I have seen of forgiveness, one that's been the most helpful to me personally, says this. Forgiveness is letting go of the hope that the past can be changed. Let that soak in a minute. Because how often do we really keep replaying things over, wishing it could be different? Forgiveness is letting go of the hope that the past could be changed. When you hear the words of the Lord's Prayer sung in just a little bit, and each time you pray the Lord's Prayer, may you allow the words of forgiveness to hit you just a little bit deeper. The song uses the forgiveness of sins. Our tradition at this church is to use debts and debtors, and many folks use the tradition of trespasses. And here's a little secret that you already know. There's no right way to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so may the words forgive us our debts and sins and trespasses as we forgive others, may all those words soak in a little deeper into your heart and into your gut so they become part of your core, a bigger part of your relationship with God and others. I wonder if the reason that we have such a hard time forgiving others is because we don't really feel worthy of forgiveness ourselves, especially from God. Perhaps we don't really feel forgiven by God for all the things about us that we think are lacking. We're not enough. 
But that, my friends, is what grace is all about. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are a precious child of God. And you are called to look upon everyone that you meet as just as loved, just as forgiven, and just as precious as you. That is so hard. But together in community with support from one another and with help from God, we can do hard things. Forgiveness is a really hard word to hear when you think about it. It's an F word that's hard to digest, that we don't want to deal with. And yet it is also salve for our souls. Because you see, forgiveness is not an F-bomb. It's an F-bomb, B-A-L-M. And it can truly soothe and heal and transform our very souls. Forgiveness can do that. Thank God.
let us accept God's invitation to confession. Let us confess to God, the author of life, knowing that there are others listening to these words with us. Let us confess that there have been times when I have acted and spoken in ways that have caused harm to others and harm to myself. I confess to the God of new beginnings that there have been times when I have neglected to speak and to act in ways that are compassionate and just. I turn my back on these sins, sins of both action and omission, and seek from God and humanity forgiveness and reconciliation with all my heart. God, inspect my character and my inmost thoughts and intentions. Shine your light upon them that I might grow in self-awareness and in the understanding of others, that my motivations may be purified by the indwelling of your spirit, that I might become fairer and kinder toward others and toward myself. accept God's invitation to forgiveness. As God lived among us and knew our frailty, so we live among others, knowing their frailty as they know ours. To learn then to forgive as God has forgiven us, neither with cheap sentiment nor hollow words, but by humility, recognizing our humanity seeing it in others, and finding relief from resentment and hatred by moving forward and letting the past be the past, far from our present thought and the wiles of the imagination. Keep us then, God of peace, in mindfulness of the joy that is forgiveness, that we may always seek it Grant it and find it near. And let us accept God's invitation now to reconciliation. We extend the word of God's love to those we have forgiven and those who have forgiven us, to all who are able to take hold of it, joining in conversation and understanding, going forward in cooperation and joint endeavor toward friendship, and love. We pray for those who continue to do harm, those for whom our forgiveness must come but with distance and parting, until the other has come to a place of understanding, knowing the harm they do, and seeking to turn away from it and start anew. We also pray for those who cannot yet forgive, who are consumed by their anger and hurt, God, bring healing to their souls and set them free, free to love and live once more. Amen.
And now, as our worship draws to its end, we ask once more for our communities in these fast-changing and unpredictable times that they might experience a deepening anchor of mutual respect and trust, of companionship and hope. Help us to rally around our shared purpose, our mission of friendship and the building of a society in which the realm of God is made visible, one in which all are known and all are loved. Amen. Hi, my name is Katie Cohn, and I'd like to talk with you about this month's benevolence offering. Each month, we have a special offering in addition to our normal offering that is directed towards various missions and organizations in Louisville, as well as to our United Church of Christ denomination. These financial gifts are just one of the ways that we live out Jesus' call to serve others. I want to say thank you for everything you all are doing to further the mission of St. Andrew United Church of Christ. This is such an uncertain time in our world, and even in the midst of the upheaval it's causing our lives, you are making the mission of St. Andrew a priority. Thank you for staying connected with one another, staying focused on sending in your pledges, and even continuing to give to benevolences. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in this very moment. During the month of September, our benevolences are directed towards neighbors in need. This is one of the four special mission offerings of the United Church of Christ. These offerings, along with what we give to our church's wider mission, or OCWM as many know it, help to ensure the success and sustainability of the United Church of Christ's national ministries as we, as we contribute to basic operating support and mission. One of the ways that our neighbors in need offerings make a difference is in the mission of Peace Congregational United Church of Christ in South Carolina. When LGBTQ individuals near the campus of Clemson University or in the areas of upstate South Carolina unexpectedly find themselves without a home or a place that feels safe, Peace Congregational United Church of Christ has created a safe place for them. Neighbors in Need helped those congregational members and the Clemson community as they worked side by side designing and constructing a tiny house, a mobile residency for a person in the LGBT community who's no longer welcome at home. The $20,000 project was given support with a $10,000 grass stop grant from the United Church of Christ Justice and Witness Ministries. Neighbors in Need is a special mission offering supporting the United Church of Christ in justice and witness in compassion throughout the United States. One third of, of Neighbors in Need funds support for the Council of American Indian Ministry, or CAIM. Two thirds of the Neighbors in Need offering is used by the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministries to support a variety of justice initiatives, advocacy efforts, and direct service through projects and grants. Neighbors in Need grants are awarded to UCC churches organizations all doing justice work in their communities. These grants fund projects whose work ranges from direct services to community organizing to advocacy, all addressing systematic injustice. As you determine what your gift might be this month for neighbors in need, know that your gift combined with all the others help ministries of justice and compassion on a much larger level than we could ever do by ourselves, as Pastor Lori likes to tell us. For more information, please make sure to visit ucc.org slash NIN. Thank you again for your commitment to serving others in Jesus' name. And remember, stay safe, wash your hands, and wear your mask. <laughs>